Snap Judgment Studios. Daily Show correspondent Dulce Sloan and writer Josh Johnson are best friends who rarely agree on anything. On the new podcast called Hold Up with Dulce Sloan and Josh Johnson, they turn their hilarious, unpredictable, and legendary office banter into a war of words about topics big and small, mostly small, from texting versus calling to club bangers versus conscious rap and everything in between. Listen to Hold Up with Dulce Sloan and Josh Johnson from The Daily Show every Thursday on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Attention shoppers, we now have Taste in the Bread Aisle, Dave's Killer Bread. That's right, an organic bread that's no longer a sedative for your taste buds. Dave's Killer Bread is on a mission to make the most of the loaf, to rid the world of GMOs, high fructose corn syrup, and artificial ingredients, and plant the seeds of good in all that they bake. Killer taste, killer texture, always organic. Dave's Killer Bread. Bread Amplified. Midnight, 1963, there is only one possible way out of East Berlin, Checkpoint Charlie. And there, officers, military personnel, local police with all manner of insignia patrol this tiny crossing. Heinz knows the setup, but Heinz notices that when the gate swings closed, there's a gap under the iron swing bar. And that gap gives him an idea. Actually, love gives Heinz an idea. Marguerite. Beautiful Marguerite. She's hiding in the back seat. Her mother squeezed into the trunk. So sweat stains Heinz's shirt as he drives his convertible serenely up to the checkpoint. Top down, Heinz coasts slowly through the customs area as armed guards motion him over for inspection. Yeah, buddy. Here I come. Hines nods to the officers. Here I come for your inspection. But instead, Hines guns the engine, speeds past the concrete barrier, swerves between shouting officers, praise that's not an AK firing on him as he rushes the obstacle course. The gate is closed as he speeds towards it. But Hines has let the air out of his tires taking the windshield off his car. And last moment, racing toward freedom, Heinz ducks his head and goes under the gate with his future wife and mother-in-law in the back of the car. Yeah! Yeah! Good stuff, right? Good stuff. Well, today on Snap Judgment, um, see, we're going back the other way. Snap Judgment proudly presents the Iron Curtain. Amazing stories about a line on the map. My name is Lynn Washington. You see, stories about men are often really stories about women. When you're listening, when you're listening to Snap Judgment. We begin across the Iron Curtain itself, back to that place that no longer exists, Communist East Berlin. Washington Post Berlin reporter and friend of the snap, Louisa Beck, leads the way. So I was born in what used to be East Germany, just before the fall of the Berlin Wall. And like a lot of Germans of my generation, I don't remember communism. Instead, we grew up hearing stories from our parents about what it was like. Stories about smuggled Beatles albums, forced patriotism, and small crappy cars. But the craziest stories were always about the Stasi, the East German secret police. The Stasi were infamous for the extreme lengths they went to spy on their own people. They say that something like one in seven East German citizens were coerced into informing on their friends and relatives. Real 1984 type stuff. And for younger Germans, it's strange to think that this was the world that our parents lived in every day. But 
Not too long ago, I saw a movie about the Stasi, and there was one detail from the film about something the Stasi supposedly did that, personally, for me, I thought was just too crazy to believe. So when I had the chance to interview someone who had been surveyed and interrogated by the Stasi in real life, I had to ask. I have so many questions in my head, but... In the film, there there is a scene where I ask myself, how is this possible? That during the interrogations, they would try to collect the smells of people? Is this correct? Did they really try this? Oh, yes. During the interrogations, I had to sit on a small piece of cloth. Back then, I didn't know why I should sit on this cloth. I probably thought that they suspected I was incontinent. Uh, incontinent or was, yeah. I only found out later that these were smelling tests and that this fabric was put into a glass jar for sniffer dogs. <laughs> this is Ulrike Poppe. She was a famous dissident in East Germany in the 70s and 80s. And the reason I wanted to talk to her was that even by the Stasi's standards of surveillance, she was special. From 1978 until 1989, Ulrike was one of the most surveilled people in East German history. For starters, she says that basically she was followed every second of every day she spent outside the house. Sometimes they tried to hide. Other times they were very obvious. One and a half meters behind us, three, four young people, young men. And somehow they had these grey faces. You could see it. And the way these guys looked at the wall when you passed them on the stairs, they could only be Stasi. What do you mean they looked away? They avoided eye contact? Yeah, yeah. Yes, they would look away. And they didn't greet anyone. And my little daughter always wanted to play with them. <laughs> But they were just standing there, their arms hanging down. Ulrike <laughs> says that she sometimes tried to dodge her Stasi minders by riding around on a bike and taking back alleys. But then the Stasi just got their own bikes and rode after her. Then a friend made me a map of all the backyards and the paths through them. You could enter a house, climb over the rubbish bins and leave through another house on a totally different street. But apparently the Stasi also had such a map. Anyway, they always managed to catch me again somehow. And of course, Ulrike's surveillance didn't stop at her front door. From the late 70s onward, she and her husband knew that their apartment was bugged. Whispering was futile, but background noise was good. You could really drown things out with background noise. But later I discovered that they also had filmed into our windows. Now, you might think that to merit this kind of attention from the Stasi, Ulrike was some kind of super spy or a resistance fighter, hiding out in safe houses, sabotaging rail lines. But really, no. Ulrike's forms of resistance were actually pretty tame. She and her husband founded a dissident group called the Initiative for Peace and Human Rights. Their members hosted readings of banned books, distributed pamphlets calling for free elections, and organized protest marches. So why all the surveillance? Why didn't the Stasi just lock her up and throw away the key? Well, the problem, at least for the Stasi, was that Ulrike's dissident activities made her a little too famous, especially in the West. And East Germany didn't want the bad press. They wanted to seem like benevolent socialists, not a ruthless authoritarian regime. So, sure, they could occasionally arrest Ulrike, interrogate her, and do things like collect her smells. But in the end, they always had to let her go. So... When she wasn't stirring up trouble, Ulrike's life was, at least on the surface, pretty normal. I came from a good home and worked for the Museum of German History. And there were presents for the children at Christmas, so I had a job, the kids, everything. But my husband and I were aware that every word, every private conversation, every argument over the washing up, was being listened to and analyzed by the Stasi. And that 
kein gutes Gefühl. Was not a good feeling. To not have any private space. All we could do was to try to carry on with life as though no one was listening. And I thought I had managed to cope with this quite well. But now I'm not so sure. Ulrike explained that it was this psychological pressure, more than anything, that was the real reason for the surveillance. The Stasi always knew that it would be hard to lock her up. So instead, they were trying to essentially gaslight Ulrike and her friends until they lost confidence and gave up. They were trying to drive her crazy, literally. So there was a whole load of small problems in our life. And they were actually formally known as measures to spread uncertainty and insecurity. You can look it up on the internet. Measures to spread uncertainty and insecurity? Yeah. Yes. So, zum Beispiel. For example, I'd come out of the shopping hall with my two kids and all my shopping bags and would sit the kids on the bike and then find that my tires were flat. Of course, if it had happened just once, you would think that you'd ridden over a piece of glass or that someone had played a prank on you. But because it happened so often, I began to suspect it was a Stasi strategy to unsettle us. But Ulrike didn't dare talk about that stuff with anyone because she remembered what had happened to her friend Karen. Karin, die war Ärztin. Karin was a doctor, a pediatrician. She was extremely tidy and she told us that someone had been in her flat and had switched the towels around. She always put the red towel to the right and the white one to the left. But when she got home, the white was on the right and the red on the left. But Karen was a sensitive person, so everyone thought she was just being paranoid. Was macht das die Stasi? Why would the Stasi go into people's flats to switch around their towels? So, warum sollte sie das machen? It would be too stupid. Es war aber Teil But actually, it was part of their plan. They knew she was psychologically unstable. And they also realized that if Karin went around talking about things like that, she would become less credible. And eventually, she was unable to work. And she is daran zerbrochen. And it broke her. So when the Stasi kept puncturing Ulrike's tires, she was careful not to talk about it too much. In case people said that I was paranoid, because of course, we didn't have any proof. And even if she did have someone to tell, a friend perhaps, there was always the problem that that friend might be an informer, someone who had been planted or turned by the Stasi to spy on her. For example, with a colleague of mine. Und man konnte ja nicht sicher sein. I just couldn't be certain. But sometimes I'd have this inkling. Inwiefern? In what way? <laughs> His apartment looked different, was decorated differently. It was as though someone else, someone from the Stasi, had decorated his apartment for him. There was just no individuality, nothing. Anyway, I was very anxious. Ulrike's life was like a play being watched by the Stasi, staged by the Stasi, even cast by the Stasi. What was real? Who was real? It was these lingering suspicions and the not knowing more than anything that drove her crazy. She didn't even know who was in charge of her case. She'd never met them. What she did know was that somewhere inside the Stasi headquarters was a file with her name on it that had the answers. And sometimes she fantasized about absurd and dangerous things. I'd been dreaming about having the opportunity to view my file for a long time. I wondered whether I might be able to find a rogue state security agent whom I could maybe meet with and who would be able to bring it to me. I was really curious about what it would contain, what the Stasi's plans were, how much they had heard. But also, To what extent events had been manipulated by them? And to what extent I had been able to direct my own life? And this would have been Ulrike's life, trying to act normal while being constantly watched and wondering the whole time about what was real and what was fake, forever. 
But then, after almost a decade of round-the-clock surveillance, something happened that would turn everything upside down. A uh, prospect that uh, no one could have predicted a year ago or even a month ago. This has been a city physically divided for 28 years. It's our top story. The Iron Curtain between East Germany and West Berlin has come tumbling down. East Germany announced today it is opening its borders, allowing its citizens to go anywhere they wish. On November 9th, 1989, the Berlin Wall fell. Two months later, the Stasi's headquarters were overrun by protesters. Their officer corps was disbanded, their listening devices disconnected, the tape recorder stopped. Their entire surveillance state disappeared overnight. And as for Ulrike, who had dreamt of getting to see her Stasi file, she was about to get her wish. I can remember that day very well. I was full of anticipation. Now, finally, all this secret knowledge was going to be brought into the light of day. In the winter of 1992, at the invitation of a special government commission, Ulrike and her husband, along with a few other dissidents who had been under particularly extensive surveillance, all walked together into an austere gray building. And then they were ushered into this big room and sat down at a little table in a long line of tables. And that's when the staff walked in with the files. And obviously we assumed that all of this surveillance would be formally recorded and filed somewhere. But still, we were strangely taken aback when an entire cart was pushed up to our table. Not a file, not a box. An entire cart with boxes worth of files. I hadn't anticipated such a huge volume of material. Ich hatte eigentlich keine Vorstellung. I couldn't really imagine it. Trolleys full of files. When we told you that Ulrike was one of the most surveilled people in East Germany, she didn't actually know that until now. When she opened the folders, it seemed as if the Stasi must have recorded everything she had ever done, almost down to the minute, where she was, what she said, what she ate for lunch that day. They even had recorded what time the light went out in the evening and what time we got up in the morning. So then my husband and me began to leaf feverishly through these mountains of folders and we read and read and read. Back in her apartment, all these years later, Ulrike takes down a carefully labeled three-inch binder from her shelf. It's one of over 60 she's been sent over the years. So this is, so to speak, a summary of my life. And if I want to know, for example, what happened on October 15th, 1986, I can look in here. But the thing Ulrike really cares about is not what's written in the reports, but who wrote them. Because remember, for years she had never been sure which of her friends had been informants, basically ratting her out and passing their private conversations onto the Stasi. When she opened her file, she got to find out who had been a true friend and who had betrayed her. Here's a report by the informant Franz about a party we attended from the 31st of August 1988. There's one to three reports on that one party alone. And who are the witnesses recorded here? That's everyone else who attended. I'll show you now how many of them were informants. Not Grimm, not Böttcher, not Weissung. Böhmer was an informant. Harz was an informant. Wetzky was an informant. Pavlicak was an informant. Dietrich was an informant. So out of 13, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 Spitzel. 5 were informants. Wow, fast die Hälfte. So, almost half. Und wa was war das für eine... Aufgeführt, der IMB Wolf war auch... Oh, here's another one mentioned, Wolf. He was also an informant. So, yeah. six informants in total. Also, das war die Initiative... So, that was in the most radical opposition group. And it was infiltrated by a huge number of informants. 
sind ungefähr, also insgesamt. There's about all in all over 80 informants in these files, in all the files. That's 80 separate people, eight zero, who were informing on Ulrike. She says that in the case of people who were clearly coerced into becoming informants, she's happy to forgive them and move on. Aber dann gibt's andere Berichte. But then there are other reports which emit denunciatory zeal, which are nasty and mean-spirited, and where you suspect a pleasure in causing harm. So some I can accept and continue to maintain some level of contact, but with others, ich einfach gar kein Interesse mehr. I'm just not interested anymore. Und wer ist das, der diesen What about the informant who wrote this report we're reading? Franz? Franz, das war sein Deckname. His code name was Franz. And I read several reports by him on that first day in the archives. And it was clear that I had had a close relationship with this person. But who could he be? Well, eventually I found a report which allowed me to conclusively identify him. And I called him while I was still in the archives and expressed my horror. I said, how could you? Why didn't you speak to me about this, especially because you had two years to tell me? Why am I discovering this from the files? Why? And he hummed and hawed and said that, yes, we should speak about it and so on. And that evening I called him, but no one picked up the phone. I asked a friend to go round to check on him. And then this friend called me and said, the car is parked outside, but no one is answering the door. So then my friend and I had a terrible suspicion, and she got someone to break down the door. He was found inside, unconscious, but still alive. He had tried to poison himself. Sadly, what happened to Franz was pretty common at that time. The opening of the Stasi archives caused a huge amount of anxiety among East Germans. A lot of people who had been pressured into being informants, thinking no one would ever know, were suddenly about to be unmasked. Some committed suicide before the files were even opened. It got to the point where some started to wonder whether the files should be destroyed instead and never read at all. Maybe it was better to leave the past in the past and let everyone move on. So what happened to Ulrike's friend Franz felt almost like an omen. And the experience of this suicide attempt did cause me to have major doubts about whether it was right for me to look at the files. Because while I wanted to know the truth and knew it was important in order to come to terms with what had happened, I didn't think it was worth a human life. So at first I was very unsure of how to proceed. But I believe the truth is more important. I'm really sure of that. Ich hatte nie Zweifel, sondern ich wollte das immer wissen. I just wanted to know. It was very important to me. When Snap returns, Ulrika meets the man behind the files and follows her need to know down the rabbit hole. Snap Judgment, The Iron Curtain. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Snap Judgment. When we left off, Ulrika Papa revealed some very personal secrets to reporter Louisa Beck. But what Ulrika told Louisa next? Well, you gotta hear that for yourself. As Ulrika and I sifted through her Stasi file, I kept thinking about Franz, the friend turned informant who had tried to commit suicide when he was found out. When seeking the truth, can you go too far? Is it better to dig or leave the past in the past to move on? It felt like a terrible catch-22 because the only way to be sure that you don't want to know something is to know it. Then we came across a name that Ulrike had always, during all those decades of secrecy, wanted to know. Der Name Schiller is There's references to a Lieutenant Schiller everywhere. 
Ja, ja, also das war ihr Führungsstil. Yes, exactly. Genau. Mal, aber Schild. Ja. So you can see, it's marked Schiller. Schiller, Schiller. Here again, Schiller. Chief Lieutenant Schiller. Okay. It's a lot, isn't it? Ja. Das sind ja Seiten. There's pages and pages signed by him. Ja, entgegengenommen, geschrieben. Yes, he received them and edited them. Chief Lieutenant Detlef Schiller was the Stasi officer who had been in charge of much of Ulrike's surveillance. It had been his job to know everything there was to know about Ulrike, but she had never even known his name. So when Ulrike fantasized about meeting a Stasi officer, someone who could tell her not just what the Stasi did to her, but why and what they were thinking, she had been talking about Schiller. She just didn't know it. Then, shortly after the wall fell, a former informant told Ulrike that she had recognized Schiller's name in the classified section of the local paper. He was looking for work, and what's more, he had listed a phone number. Of course she wanted to meet him. She had to. I don't think he ever imagined meeting me. He probably didn't even expect me to want to meet him. But I had a thousand questions. Ulrike didn't call Schiller up right away. He had clearly been trying to keep his past a secret. So instead, she arranged a kind of sting operation. She got another friend, a higher up at a good company, to get in touch with him. And my friend suggested that they go for a drink. So they went to a bar and I was sitting behind a wall. And I heard my friend say, Well, on another subject, Schiller, I have a friend in East Berlin who claims that you were an officer in the state security department. And he paused and then took the Stasi man by the arm and said, she's right here, in this bar. Come with me, let's go and sit at her table. And he nahm ihn und setzte ihn neben mich. And he sat him next to me and positioned himself in front of us so that the Stasi man couldn't get away. And the Stasi officer sat there with a red face and glazed eyes. And I sat next to him and said, Sie wissen so viel über mich. Mr. Schiller, you know so much about me, but I don't know anything about you. Jetzt erzählen Sie mal. Would you talk to me? And finally, he just said somewhat unsteadily, Was wollen Sie denn wissen? Well, what do you want to know? And then we ordered shots. They ended up speaking for hours, and Ulrike finally got to ask her thousand questions. I wanted to know about who he was, how long he'd been with the state security department, how he viewed himself and his job. How he appraised it ethically and morally. Also, how he viewed us. What was his perspective on the world? How were the Stasi personnel motivated? Were the enemy? Why were we the enemy? What were the orders? Although I was obviously also interested in finding out exactly which methods they used. The details, not just the big things like the surveillance and the informants, but the little things, the coincidences. The fact that my bicycle tires were punctured, which was one of these little acts of minor personal terrorism. He confirmed it, and it was important to me to have that confirmation. Ulrike had even more questions, so that night they arranged a second meeting, and then a third, a fourth, He would drive me out to a country pub at the edge of Berlin because he was scared of bumping into friends. I always assured him that I would keep what he told me to myself as long as he wanted me to. If he was so concerned about this getting out, why do you think he was interested in continuing to meet you? Da kann ich jetzt nur spekulieren. I can only speculate about that. Ich glaube, es ging ihm auch ein But Stück I think for him it was in part about me understanding him. Warum er diesen Beruf ausgeübt hat. Why he was in this profession. He tried to explain to me that at the age of 18, he came from a home where it was never up to question that this form of socialism meant happiness for all humankind. And initially he was given great opportunities. He got a good education. He could speak several languages. He was actually at the beginning of a good career. In fact, the Stasi superiors looked after their more junior colleagues. They partied and drank together, celebrated birthdays, and even got involved in the most private aspects of life. So if, for instance, there was a marriage crisis, 
The bosses helped patch things up. Sie waren so eine Ersatzfamilie. The system was like a surrogate family. And so he had never had any contact with anyone who was critical of the system and would have allowed him to see things differently. But he also wanted to talk with me about the facts that he thought differently about it now and that actually society should give him a chance to start over again. And to Ulrike, these didn't sound like excuses, like the hypocritical explanations some of her informer friends had offered. Schiller, to her, seemed really sincere. And the more she talked with him, the more she agreed that he deserved a second chance. Ich war bereit dazu. And I was ready for it. Er wusste, dass ich he knew that I didn't approach him as a judge, just as somebody who wanted to know what had happened in his life and in his position in this institution. Yes, I think there was a kind of expectation of healing on both sides. For both sides. But at their next meeting, and the next, Ulrike didn't see any signs of Schiller starting over. If anything, he seemed more and more troubled. He was worried that it would become known at his kid's school that he had worked for the state security. And sometimes he would say things like, my wife doesn't want any of this, it's all very difficult, she doesn't understand me. When Ulrike met Schiller again, he showed up with alcohol on his breath. And the way he drank gave me the impression that he wanted to anesthetize himself. He wasn't like other Stasi officials Ulrike had read and heard about, the ones who found ways to use their Stasi training somewhere else and opened security companies in the West. They didn't dwell on their past. But somebody like him who really had qualms and who regretted many things about what he did in his life and what he believed in, they can't take it anymore. So he was absolutely desolate. And he took the question of guilt so seriously. Then finally, one night, Schiller called her up, not just tipsy, but drunk. Blind drunk. He was really slurring his words. Er hatte kein besonderes Anliegen. There didn't seem to be anything specific he wanted to speak to me about, so I just asked him how he was doing. He said he was unemployed and that his family had left him. He was completely alone. It was terrible. Ulrike suggested that perhaps Schiller attend something called a restorative justice meeting, where victims and perpetrators of the Stasi era got together and tried to process what had happened. Schiller agreed, but a few days later, he called her back. He told her that he'd spoken with the organizer and asked who else would be sitting there. And he listed Schwane, Zeiseweiss, Herga, etc. Das waren alles seine Chefs. They were all Schiller's old bosses. Die sitzen doch da und zu pay. And then he said, I cannot go there. They are sitting there to stop people like me talking. Damit hat er völlig recht gehabt. Which turned out to be completely spot on. What do you mean? They're sitting there? Well, they sat in on the sessions and took part in them. But they were sitting there to prevent any Stasi co-workers from disclosing too much. Because state security employees who had spoken out about their work had been threatened, seriously threatened. It was as though blinders fell from my eyes. The system ensures that no one talks, even today. Ulrike lost track of Schiller after that. But then she got another call about a year later. A friend had stumbled over an obituary in the newspaper. And, and she told me that it looked like Detlef Schiller had died. Und offenbar hat sich das dann bestätigt. And then it was confirmed. He drank and drank and drank. Getrunken, getrunken, getrunken. And in the end, Und sich das Leben genommen. he committed suicide. Do you know how it happened? No, I never learned. I wonder, hearing this story, when you confront the past, isn't there also the possibility of being kind of enchained by it? Like, 
Do you think Mr. Schiller was stuck in the past too much? That it was actually damaging him? No, I think it was more the present that seemed so bleak to him. Seine Familie, sein Freundeskreis, his family, his friends, his work, his perspective, his convictions. Es war alles weg. Everything was gone. Mit einem Schlag. With one blow. Mit 18 hat er begonnen. He started at 18 and at 38 his life was over. And if you don't have support from other people, you can't get over that. Der schafft das dann nicht. So when I heard of his death, I felt sad. And I also blamed myself. I felt I should have maybe done more to help him get back on his feet. But we were just too remote from each other. I was able to offer forgiveness. Ich, ich konnte nicht wirklich ihm einen Ausweg weisen. But I couldn't show him a way out. Throughout my interview with Ulrike, I kept thinking about my dad. Like Ulrike, like Schiller, he grew up in East Germany. So after the Berlin Wall fell, he put in a request, and the government archive sent him his Stasi file in two big, fat binders. When he got it in the mail, he read it once and then burnt it, threw it into a fireplace. He just wanted to leave the past behind and move on with his life. I asked Ulrike if maybe he had the right idea. Well, everybody has to find their own limit. Those who have the feeling that they haven't made their peace open themselves more towards what happened. But there are many people for whom it's not important to rummage around in the past. Und es kommt auch immer darauf an, was das für eine Vergangenheit ist. It always depends on what kind of past there is. Thank you so much to Ulrika Papa for sharing her story with the SNAP. And please note that we've changed certain names in this story to protect their privacy. Thanks as well to the Stasi Records Agency, as well as Mava Flandorfer, Anina Lehman, and voice actor Susan Tackenberg for helping bring Ulrika's story to life. And special thanks to the journalist Andrew Curry, whose initial reporting in Wired magazine clued us into this story. And as for Louisa Beck, our faithful reporter, you can find her filing stories for the Washington Post Berlin Bureau. I'm going to have a link to both her and Andrew's work on our website, snapjudgment.org. The original score for that piece was by Renzo Gorio. It was produced by Louisa Beck, with production assistance from Joe Rosenberg. It happened again, Snappers. It happened again, and if you missed even a moment of today's Snap Judgment episode, subscribe. Snap Judgment, the podcast. Subscribe to our podcast that we make for everybody. And if you love Snap storytelling, storytelling currently being made in 20 different houses, not under the same roof. Storytelling made for you. Support it. Go to our Patreon page and help us do what we do best. Patreon.com slash Snap Judgment. Patreon.com slash snap judgment and if you have a story you'd like to share with our snap family we'd love to hear it we would email us pitches at snapjudgment.org that's pitches at snapjudgment.org snap is brought to you by the team that for sure would have escaped to the other side of the berlin wall all of us except for of course the uber producer mr mark ristich Captain cd miller anna sussman ringo gorio john facile shana sheely Marissa Dodge, Liz Mack, Nika Singh, Eliza Smith, Lauren Newsom, Taylor Decott, Flo Wiley, Nancy Lopez, and Leon Morimoto. And this is not the news. No way is this the news. In fact, you could stick your mother-in-law in the trunk, escape across the wall, and all the excitement and drinks and celebration and such. Not remember until about 4.30 a.m. sharp the next day exactly where your mother-in-law is. And you'd be in trouble, but you'd still, still, still not be as far away from the news as this is. But this is PRX. PRX.